Hey, how's it going everyone? I'm Carlo and I'm here with my cousin Dylan as always. And today we are talking about our most anticipated games of 2022. Uh, when we did last year's list for 2021, we each picked five games. This time we're each picking 10. Uh, we have not gone over our uh, picks with each other. So we're expecting maybe a couple of overlaps, I think. Uh, and I don't know about you, I was looking back at last year's list a couple days ago before I was picking these. And I had a laugh because out of our 10 combined picks from last year, I think only two or three of them actually released. Uh, all the other ones, some of them we've either pre-ordered and they haven't arrived or we backed them on Kickstarter or they just never hit retail and got delayed. Yeah, we should change the title so, to most anticipated games that may, might release. In yeah, <laughs> exactly. So there might even be some carryover for anyone who might have watched last year's list. Um, and who knows, like... Last year's video, there were months later, people were saying, how come this game didn't make your list? Well, it wasn't announced at the time, so we're doing this pretty early in the year. Um, but otherwise, anything else you want to add about this before you uh, kick it off here? Just that uh, two of the games that I included on last year's most anticipated games list are going to still be on this one. There was, there's actually three. There was a third I technically would have wanted to include, but I was just like, I need to, I can't have that many like reoccurrences. So I kept one of them off, which I'm just going to say right now is Fjords. Um, we are getting that this year from a, from backing it on Kickstarter. I am really, really excited for that game, but just in the interest of keeping this list a little bit fresh, I decided to leave that one off, but I have kept two others uh, on this list nice. that were on my last game. And to be fair, of any of them, that one is a reprint, whereas the other one yeah. a brand new game, so so good, good one to leave off in that case. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to kick it off with my number 10, which is Hegemony, Lead Your Class to Victory. So this is a very interesting sounding game. The Kickstarter campaign just ended a couple weeks ago. I considered backing this. Um, the basic idea, it's an asymmetric game where you play as uh, like the working class, the state, uh, the I think it's the capitalist class, I can't remember. Basically every player has a different uh, sort of play, um, you know, group that they're playing as. And it's this very sort of interconnected system of politics, economics, uh, you know, everyone has a completely different player board. Um, strikes can happen, there's all kinds of shifts in the economy, there's elections. Uh, it sounds like you know, the theme is normally something that wouldn't like draw me in a whole lot necessarily in a board game. Um, but after reading a couple of previews online and, and just like watching a couple of videos, just the, the way the game looks and just kind of the overall um, sort of first impressions that people have have really kind of pulled me in. And the fact that there's the influence of actual like academics, like professors and stuff who have weighed in on the design of the game, um, it's something that really intrigues me. The kind of rules complexity and the length of the game um, makes it so that I don't know if I'm actually going to get to play this in 22. I just, you know, longer games are harder to get to the table, but uh, it's something I definitely have my eye out for and I, I'd really like to play it someday. And it's just looks like a really impressive, uh, unique design. Have you ever mentioned this to me before? Because I feel like I've never heard of this before. This was one of the ones I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that was on Kickstarter at the oh, same time. I mentioned oh, yeah. another game that I imagine is going to come up on our list, which I won't spoil here. Yeah. But uh, I should have prefaced in the beginning. So I'm, re <laughs> I'm really bad at like remembering all the games. There's so many games that, that I want to play or that I'm that I am anticipating and then it'll be like Carlo reminded me like hey this is really something like oh my god like I forgot that I even wanted this game so I'm expecting there to be a couple picks in here that as Carlo says I'm gonna like quickly be changing my list because I'm like <laughs> well I cannot include that so right uh yeah this is one that yeah okay so you did mention it to me but I honestly can't remember much about it so I'd have to almost like go to the Kickstarter campaign now and just like like look at the photos again and right remember, yeah, yeah. It, it's a pricey one um but yeah it's something I'd love to try one day that nice. is hegemony all right, uh, really quickly before I get into my number 10, I just want to say that I had like an 11 that I just barely didn't put on. I had it on there originally and then I eventually took it off and that's Wormholes. Uh, so Wormholes, I, I had mentioned in a previous video is one that I'm really excited about and I am. Can't wait to get my hands on it. It's from Peter McPherson. Um, lots of cool stuff going on. It did just miss my list. But number 10 on mine is Founders of Te Teotihuacan. Mm. Uh, so this is uh, basically a standalone follow-up to Teotihuacan, uh, which is, I'm probably going to mispronounce it because I mispronounce everything. Um, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's from Board and Dice. It's a different designer. And it's basically, it's like, I think in the, in the thematics of it, it's like a prequel to the original because you're founding it. But it's a, a tiling game. So this, the, other, whereas the other one was way, a way more complex, uh, you know, um, was it, I guess what well, was worker placement, but it was also dice, dice placement. Yeah, dice, dice placement, dice drafting kind of thing. I don't so know. this one takes elements of the original, which was uh, you know you could place. Uh, uh, the, the, there was that the pyramid in the middle of the board that was like sort of the center focus. Now basically that pyramid is on everyone's player board and your player board has four districts that are surrounding the pyramid and you're taking tiles from the a center board that are sort of in polyomino type shapes mm. and you're placing them onto the four different districts you have going on into a, in, in a tile placement gameplay and the action spaces you can place one, two, or three of your, your action pieces on to take different versions of those actions. Mm. So there's a couple cool th things going on in terms of how you're taking these actions 
options. Um, I, I like I love tile placement games, and I've realized that more as I play more of them. I, I find that the ones who do it really well are the ones that end up uh, or end up being for games that stay in my collection for a long period of time that I like to introduce. So uh, the fact that I really enjoyed Teotihuacan and, and it's you know introducing a lot of things that are familiar from that game as well as in a tile placement game that's quicker to play um, is the reason it's on my list. So the box art's finally been released. It's been up on the screen here for some of you to see, and there's a, a first photo I think of it might have even just been of a prototype um, setup of the board. So we're finally getting some uh, visuals of it. It looks really good. Um, can't wait to play it. Nice. Okay. I didn't realize it was actually a follow-up to the original. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. My number nine is a game called Darwin's Journey. So uh, if you're on Kickstarter a lot, you might remember this from last year. I think it was last year that it was on there. Uh, one of the designers, Simone Luciani, has designed a couple games that I really like, which are Voyages of Marco Polo and uh, Zulkin the Mayan Calendar, which you have on your shelf behind you. Yeah. Um, and basically, this is a game that, similar to the number 10 one that I mentioned just on my list now, is another one that, because of the length of the game, the cost, uh, you know, the rules complexity and stuff, I don't know if it's one I'm actually going to get to the table in 2022, but it looks like a fascinating game uh, about, you know, Charles Darwin, the theory of evolution on the Galapagos Islands. It's a worker placement game. Uh, you have different parts of the board that you can go to. Your boat kind of moves to different sections and allows your workers to go explore different parts of the island. Um, and what really draws me into the game is when I've seen a lot of comparisons about it being a really tight, uh, kind of unforgiving game, similar to Voyages of Marco Polo. I really liked that it was really difficult to get anything done in that game. It always yeah. felt like you didn't quite have the resources you needed or you couldn't quite get to where you wanted to go. And in this game, there's a thing where you have to, like... Um, your workers need a certain, like, uh, what is it, attribute or, like, education. They have to basically learn how to do something to even be able to go to certain spots on the board. So there's okay. always, like, a prerequisite to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it has a lot of planning, and it just looks stunning. Like, not only the box cover, but the game on the table, from what I've seen, looks awesome, too. Uh, so, yeah, it's one I, I hope to play. I don't know if it's going to be anytime soon, but... Uh, I, I'm expecting this to get really good reviews as well. Yeah, this one's on my list, but it is one that I remember us like being very close to backing at the time, yeah. and then uh, deciding we were just going to try to get our hands on it uh, after it's been fully released. But yeah, yeah really excited to play this one. Um, even if it's on my list, this is one that like I I think that after I've actually played it, even though it wasn't on my anticipated games list, could easily be in contention for being one of my favorite games of next year if I'm able to actually, like you're saying, get it to the table, yeah, really dive into it and experience it. So. Yeah, for sure. That is Darwin's Journey, my number nine. Nice. Uh, my number nine is a game that was actually supposed to, I think, hit Kickstarter in like May of 2021 and then sort of fell off. And the designer um, has been in talking with uh, the forums on uh, Board Game Geek, keeping people in the loop. And that is Slay the Spire, the board game. Um, so Slay the Spire is a great video game um, that combines card uh, a card game, like, like obviously we're big card game fans, um, with the... Um, Oh, I'm forgetting the mechanic. Roguelite. Yeah, that's it. Roguelite. Um, where uh, you're basically uh, you know, ascending this spire and you're building your deck as you go with the cards you get. And every time you play, you're going to get be given different cards that are going to influence your deck. It's just, it combines so many elements I love. I played that game a whole bunch. I love it. Um, and so this is that in board game form. And the designers have been talking with people in the forum saying that the reason it's been delayed is, yes, there's been delays worldwide on, on production and prototypes, but also they want to make sure that they get it right in feeling like Slay the Spire, but not feeling like, oh, it's just the video game in board game form. They want to do some things that feel like, oh, this is like a tabletop version, but keeping all the elements that people love from yeah. Slay the Spire. So that is reassuring to me because there are a lot of, you know, products that come out sometimes that are cash-ins on other properties that are successful. Right. And to hear that they're, you know, delaying and taking time because they want to make sure that the essence of this game everyone loves is captured in a tabletop game is exciting to me because I love that game. I love tabletop games. And really, this should just be a perfect marriage that when it comes out, it should be an insta back for me. Yeah. So I'm hopeful this is a 2022 game. Realistically, if, if it... I'm expecting it to launch in the first, you know, three months of the year because that's when all the Kickstarters tend to come out. Yeah. If it does, it could be one that delivers before the end of the year. We've all seen Kickstarter delays very often. So fingers crossed that we do mm -hmm. get it. If we do, I can see this being one that, especially if it's a quick playing experience, that I'll often bring to the table and especially solo because it sounds like there's going to be a solo mode yeah. as well. That's If it's as good as the video game, I'll be playing I wouldn't be surprised bunch. if it ends up being best solo without knowing yeah. much about the game. Honestly, I just bought this on Steam. It was on sale oh, a nice. couple weeks ago and nice. I haven't actually got a chance to play it yet. But uh, mm. yeah, as soon as you, like I read about the game, it felt like one that should be a tabletop version. Yeah. So yeah. honestly, uh, if I hadn't forgotten about this one, it probably would have made my yeah. list. <laughs> yeah, so let's lay the spire. Let's all cross our fingers and toes and hope it comes out in 2022. All right, nice pick. 
My number eight is a game that until just a few days ago, I mean, by the time this is released, it'll be a few weeks ago, but we're filming this mid-December, but just a few days ago, I actually got a name and a description and everything on Board Game Geek. This is Oranian Burger Canal, and it is going to be the new Uwe Rosenberg, uh, Uwe Rosenberg game. Oh my god, I this, have not heard about well, this. Well, this is the one that we talked about a few months ago that at the time, it's published by Spielworks, and they had only released a tweet on their Twitter saying, oh, there's oh, going to be a new Uwe Rosenberg right. game, and for the longest time when I was trying to compile this list, I just had it as new Uwe Rosenberg game, question mark, and then just yesterday when I was putting together my list, I went and looked it up on Board Game Geek, and there, there was, it was there, Oranian Burger Canal, there's zero pictures, nothing about the cover, anything, there's just one single forum post that has a, like an interview, uh, where someone interviewed Uwe Rosenberg asking him about it, and if you go to the BGG page, it says at the top as of now that it's only for one player, but when you read the little interview, it says it's for one or or two players, so two players max. So he says he compares it a little bit to Fields of Arl, which is another game that we haven't played, but is also only one or two players. Yeah. And uh, from what I gathered, go read go read the forum post. It's really interesting. But from what I gathered, it's sort of a tile laying game where you are laying down these tiles on your board, and then you're trying to surround them with on all four sides with um, I think they're like roads or little pathways or whatnot. And the abilities are, or the effects on the tiles will trigger up to twice maximum. First, when you surround it on all four sides. And then again, when you can link it with a bridge to another tile. So it's a very like thinky, puzzly game where you're, you really have to plan and figure out what you're going to put where and when you're going to do everything. Um, and I think Uwe Rosenberg himself said that it's of his designs as the game that made his brain hurt the most. He said something like, after I played, I had to go have lunch and refuel or something like that. <laughs> have lunch. Like, yeah, and so anyway, there isn't a whole lot of info about the game, but anything that's Uwe Rosenberg, we're always going to be curious about. And the fact that this seems like it's, you know, we, we thought, we'd heard some rumor before that, you know, Howler Tower might have been his last kind of like big box design. It sounds like, even though this one is, only goes up to two players max, um, I think we both agreed that Howler Tau, we, when we played it, it was really good at two and we thought it wouldn't be any better with three or four necessarily. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, I'm curious to hear a lot more about this game and, you know, if I knew more, it could be higher on the list, could be lower, but as of now, it's kind of sitting in this mystery range of, right. I just want to know more about the game yeah. so and play it. So if you look right here in editing, I'm going to put an asterisk, and then I'm going to put that uh, Dylan forgot about this game, <laughs> because uh, I, I completely forgot about this game, and uh, it would have absolutely been on my list. I'm not even going to cheat and try to like insert it. I'll, I'll take the take the, the, the loss here. But uh, yeah, this sounds awesome. I'm on board for anything Uwe Rosenberg, um, yeah. especially if it's going to have such a strong focus on solo and two-player, because so many of his games are surprisingly great at solo yeah it's one that has a focus like that and now that now that we're even talking about that it's kind of crazy to me that i haven't played fields of arl yeah i know have you played it no okay, and yeah, he said he said it. in there that part of the reason why he hasn't gone back and designed a lot more of those one or two player games because fields of arl even though it ranks really high on board game geek because yeah. the people who play it love it a lot of people don't buy it because it doesn't play for more than two players so i think he's taking a risk here with the game mm -hmm. but that almost intrigues me more that he's like Hey, that other one didn't sell as great. I don't care. I have enough confidence in this game. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to make yeah. another one kind of thing. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Oranian Burger Canal. Awesome. We'll see if the North American name changes or if they stick with that. But Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, it's not on my list, but it should be. Uh, my number eight is another game that uh, we know n next to nothing about, but uh, and I have talked about this before, um, and that is the Elder Scrolls board game from Chip Theory. Ooh, so, okay. uh, I... Uh, I'm going to get some flack for this, but uh, I played Skyrim for the first time this year, uh, and that's a game that came out in 2011. Now. I haven't even played it yet, so... Okay, you're going to get more <laughs> I'm flack get more than flag, me. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I, it, like, I played it, and right away I'm like, how have I not played this game? It's everything that I love about video games. But uh, So like that is probably the secondary reason I'm even interested in this. We played Cloudspire... Um, and you know did a bunch of content on our channel and we were really impressed on the production values and like uh the gameplay even though it's such a heavy game that it's one that we haven't got to the table in a long time the fact that they we're taking chip theories you know uh dedication to component quality and everything and crafting a world the world of elder scrolls around it, not specifically skyrim but the elder scrolls in general uh, is super intriguing to me and i'm really curious to find out like what kind of game it's going to be because you would think they'd tap into the rpg and like uh, character progression elements I would imagine but then that and that's so different than I mean in, in some many ways it's different than, than what you know uh, Cloudspire and everything was right. uh, we haven't played too many bones but so it's hard for me to make that comparison but there's so many possibilities here that I guess what excites me and makes me it's so anticipated for me is the possibilities of what this could be um, and it was announced last year all there is is a, is a 
last year, I guess the time we're posting this, 2021 is last year, right. um, there is a landing page that says tw coming 2022. I don't know if that means a Kickstarter campaign coming in 2022 or the game mm. is. So there is another little caveat here where this could be arriving uh, in 2023 for all I know. Again, fingers crossed it's this year, but I am super, super curious about this game to find out what it is. I know there's a whole bunch of excitement about the, the Skyrim uh, board game that just was, uh, it was uh, up on Kickstarter um, and that had a lot of buzz and this is the fact that this is Elder Scrolls in general and has chip theory behind it. I'm super pumped. I cannot wait to get my hands on this and see what it, what it is all involved. Um, but again, all I can really do is show you a landing page. So you'll have to wait like the rest of us and hopefully we find out more really soon. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, honestly, if I'd played the game, it'd probably be on my list. But. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, number seven for me is a game called Paint the Roses. So this also just recently had a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, this one's going to be published by North Star Games. It's a beautiful looking game. It's set in the uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, universe, and it's a cooperative um, like logic deduction game. And those of you who watch the channel often enough and have seen us talk about a lot of games know I'm not normally crazy about cooperative games, but when they have this kind of restricted communication and you're trying to send each other signals and kind of figure things out like that without just open communication is what brings me to most cooperative games like The Crew. Um, and basically what you're doing here is there's different scenarios, different puzzles that you set up where you're trying to, um, I don't remember if it's defeat or outsmart the Queen of Hearts, but you basically have these different colored cubes and you can put them down on the board on certain places to basically send your fellow teammates like a signal and they're trying to interpret this signal and what you mean by it. Oh, cool. And then they're gonna put a different type of cube on there and you're gonna be kind of looking around at your teammates, people are smiling, no one really knows what's going on. You're trying to figure out with their clues how to solve this puzzle. So um, I, I love the crew. I love these games where you have to send these signals and figure stuff out and just the kind of uh, modular aspect of like different scenarios. It's different at different player counts. I'm sure there's going to be other content released for it. Yeah. I did not end up back in on Kickstarter, but uh, it's one that I am going to be keeping my eye out for uh, at retail and one that I'm definitely very excited to play. Nice. Yeah, honestly, I, I'm guilty of just not looking into this game enough, but mm. uh, it sounds super cool based on what you just described. And there's, there's to be honest, there's been a few games where I end up not looking into them or like find out enough about them and then you tell me about them and then I forget about them and then you tell me about them again and I finally look into them like man this game sounds good and you're and you're like yeah I know I've been telling you this for like four months so yeah. this is probably gonna end up being one of those but yeah it sounds really great yeah awesome I just paint the roses all right my number seven is a game that uh I know I can tell you right now that I'm going when it actually gets close to release I'm gonna have that moment where I'm like why didn't I just back this game but it was a it was it came up at a time that it was it's a it was an expensive mm -hmm. back and I just couldn't justify it with like moving and different things going on and that is Aridia the paths we dare tread oh, nice. um, so this is basically uh, everything I've ever wanted uh, in a board game based on the description I obviously I haven't played it but um, where it's an open world uh, campaign style game so you're basically uh, able to traverse the world um, do in like what sounds like very different directions w w making very different decisions every time and the game is going to change and reflect the decisions you've made and an example would be you know I mean, this isn't in the game but just as an example you know if you decide to go here before you ever decide to go here and you answer things a certain way by the time you get back your choice to not go here might have meant that this village got destroyed now that village is inaccessible to you during the game and that means that every time you play you can have a bit of a different experience too so that's really great there's also a progression system with like your characters involved here where you're obviously leveling up your characters it's essentially an open world rpg in board game form that you're gathering your friends around the table to enjoy that's just something that i've literally told people oh, they should really do this. I know it would take a lot of effort, a lot of design, and how do you, like, it would take so much time to make, and yet here it is, and I didn't back it. And that's literally something because I just didn't have, uh, I couldn't justify it at the time. So I'm really hoping that when it releases, I'm either able to find a copy in retail, or, you know, there's some way to get my hands on it, uh, because I would love to set this up and just do a whole bunch of sessions and dive into it. I know I will love this game. Um, I'm not saying, you know, it won't, it'll live up to every expectation I had, because I feel, I feel like I have a lot of expectations. Right. But it's one that I know I'll enjoy, and I just can't wait to try. Yeah, cool. I remember you told me about this game like a year or two ago yeah. when it was in development. And you said at the time that it had already been in development for a while or something. Mm -hmm. It's just been, and not surprising, it's such a you know beast of a game. And yeah. I think it's the same designer as uh, Zaya, yeah. right? Legends of a Drift System or whatever, which yeah. I played once a few years ago. It was pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, can't wait. Nice pick. <laughs> All right, on to my number six, which this is one I'm expecting to be a crossover on your list. I could be wrong. Maybe I might have just missed it, but uh, that is Mindbug. So this is a game that is, uh, I don't remember the names of the three other designers, but one of the four designers is Richard Garfield, who designed Magic the Gathering, and Keyforge, which these days is a game I'm playing all the time. I love Keyforge. 
and uh, it basically does something even more like where Keyforge tried to be even more approachable than Magic with just like you buy a single deck kind of thing, um, or you can buy just a single deck. Mindbug goes even the next step where the entire game comes in a single deck box, right? right? And you just have, I don't remember how many cards it is, it's like I think it's 36 or something like that, and basically you just uh, shuffle up the card, the deck of cards. A certain, each player gets a certain number of cards, and that's your deck for the game. And then you have these two mind bug cards, mm -hmm. and you're basically playing creatures back and forth. But your mind bugs allow you to take control of the other player's creatures, right? Right. So they were, the whole thing behind the design was that you know some people might say, oh, this card looks overpowered, or in this matchup, this card looks too overpowered. But that's the mind bugs balance that out because as soon as a card comes out that you think in this setup right now with what's on the board that's going to be too powerful well then you use your mind bug and you steal it right and i'm just very interested to see uh what it does with so few cards and like such a simple little like it literally just looks like a standard like the size of a 52 card deck basically it's such a small package one that we i think both talked about almost backing on kickstarter yeah. decided to wait till retail but uh we'll definitely be playing this in in 2022 i'm sure we'll have content for this on our channel at some yeah. point but Dylan and I love these two-player head-to-head card dueling games. Um, and yeah, just like the artwork and the kind of fun nature behind all the cards. Uh, yeah, it's something I can't wait to play. Yeah, this just missed my list. I had this on the short list uh, with like other options and uh, I didn't include it. Uh, we only, like, yeah, we were literally just talking about this. You know what we need to do? Hmm. <laughs> we need to ask people what, uh, besides the Feast for Odin mentions, uh, what we need, want to include uh, in a in an all you can board drinking game where people okay. take shots because I've already realized that I think we've said the word literally like oh. six <laughs> times in this video. I I was noticing as I was saying it and I can't stop myself. And then I heard you say, "I'm like, my God, like when did, when yeah, did this I begin?" Didn't, I didn't even notice it. But anyways, um, yeah, it it just missed my list. I know I will absolutely in, uh, adore this game. Um, so yeah, I cannot wait to play it, and it might be end up being one that I like that, uh, more than other games on this list. But right, yeah. I just missed it. Yeah, I cannot wait to try this again. The fact that it's a, a deck building game, or not deck building, deck uh, card uh, battling game uh, from Richard Garfield, where I don't have to really get anything besides that one box, is just super intriguing. Yeah, absolutely. That's mind bug. Nice. Uh, my number six is uh, Azul Queen's Garden. Um, I'm a huge Azul fan. Um, I have talked about this game before. Um, I was super pumped when it was announced. Uh, again, it's one of those things where I don't think that anything... I shouldn't... I mean, I don't think anything is going to surpass my love for the original Azul, even if when they get close. But everything I'm seeing about this version, I'll put the photos up on the screen, um, looks gorgeous. It keeps the, the unique drafting element that I love from all the other Azul titles, um, where, you know, when you take the tiles you want, the rest get sort of but you have to take every one of a certain color or a certain shape, whatever it, whatever it is in that game, and then the rest get pushed to the center, um, and then the center becomes m more and more full with all the different colors gathered in there. Um, so it keeps that, that part that I love, and it basically creates a new tile um, or you know placement game uh, based on uh, the, the Queen's Garden, and, and it looks... I, I don't even know exactly how you're scoring all your points based on the board. I'm sure that there's something released now where if I really wanted to dive into it, I could. I just know that I've enjoyed the uh, Stained Glass of Sintra, and I know know I'll enjoy um, Summer Pavilion after I play on some level, even right. if it's not as much as the original. So I know I'll enjoy this game, and it's one of those things where now that you have Summer Pavilion and I have the original and Stained Glass of Sintra, I want to get this version so we have all the versions. One day we can do this like massive Azul session where we can pay all the games and yeah. really yeah. get down to the nitty gritty of like which one do we think is the best one truly. Yeah. Take which is the best at which player count yes, and everything. Take yeah, nostalgia yeah. out of it just in terms of gameplay, in terms of two player, three player, four player, like, let's just figure out the For definitive sure. Azul um, experience, right? Yeah. So, well, maybe yeah. they'll announce number five by then. Yeah, right? probably. <laughs> They're never going to stop making Azul games. Yeah. But yeah, I've heard this one actually called, uh, some people said it's Azul meets Calico. Uh, I really like Calico, so that makes me even more intrigued to try it out, but it did not quite make my list. Yeah, nice. All right, now onto my number five pick, which this was actually number one on last year's Most Anticipated for 2021, and it just got delayed. It's a game I backed on Kickstarter. It's the game I've ever spent the most money on backing on Kickstarter. I went all in on this, over $200. That is Guards of Atlantis 2. So this has slipped to number five for a couple reasons. First off, uh, last year when we made this list, I was not yet a dad. Now I have a three and a half month old uh, child. And basically this is a pretty hefty game to get into and one that involves like, at, it's probably gonna involve four players or more at best because it's a team-based game that you can play up to 
think it's 10 players, maybe it's eight, but uh, basically if you've played those um, uh, MOBA style games like Dota and you know uh, Heroes of the Storm, League of Legends, that kind of thing, you're basically, each player plays as like a hero um, and you're against another team and you're trying to push the lane of either minions towards the other team's base or defeat all their characters. Um, it's a game that's, the, the big kind of selling point or one of the big selling points is the fact that there's no luck involved. There's no dice rolling, there's no like random card draws, there's no random events. You just have your deck of cards for your, um, uh, your, your, your hero's like abilities and you have five cards in your hand, one of each color, and basically everyone at the same time is putting a card face down and then you flip them over and then you look at the initiative order on the numbers, kind of Gloomhaven style, and then you resolve those abilities in order, moving around the terrain, using different abilities, and once everyone has played four of their five cards, everyone picks up their cards again, and then you have that hand of five cards again, you keep playing, but you can upgrade your cards to the battle to bigger abilities and stuff like that. So it seems like a game that's gonna get its best plays if you play it with the same group of people and you play it over and over and you start to unlock this kind of meta and you know once you know what the other heroes do and you can anticipate and you know okay that hero is more of an assassin that one's more of a support i can expect this sort of thing to happen so i don't know how much we're going to actually be able to get this to the table i don't know how soon it's supposed to arrive um based on the last kickstarter update i got i think it's kind of nearing the end of production hopefully don't quote me on that i can't remember but uh yeah it's it's one i never got a chance to play the original guards of atlantis but uh I, I just can't wait to play this. I'm so pumped about this game. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for you. Uh, I'm <laughs> also you. I'm also excited to be invited over to play it. And I think Absolutely. that we, we don't really do unboxing videos on our channel anymore. But if there was ever a game that uh, you yeah know, people might want to see, and if not, I just definitely want to see it unbox. Is probably Guards of Atlantis too because yeah. It, yeah, you went all, like, all in on it, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of it. Seems like there's a lot of stuff coming, um, and it's just one of those games that I think is going to be super uh, interesting and beautiful to unpack and like for sure you know, set up for the first time. Yeah, so. I, I had to. Go all in because it was the variety of the characters. I think yeah. the base game came with 10 or something like that, or 8, yeah. and I think with all in, I got 20 or something like that. So anyways, I can't wait to explore this game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Guards of Atlantis 2. Nice. Uh, okay, my number 5 is a game that I'm pretty sure is on Carlo's list and probably might end up being our only crossover here, uh, and that is Dice Realms. Yes. Uh, so Dice Realms is a game from Tom Lehman. Um, this is on my list because when I first heard about this game, I didn't even, for whatever reason, look at what who the designer was. It was just the concept that uh, intrigued me. The the dice construction and being able to change the die faces reminded me of um, Dice Forge, I think it's called, yeah. um, which we only played a couple times, and I, I wasn't that ecstatic about, but the concept was something that I just loved the idea yeah. of. Especially, I, we, I've never played the physical version of it, but I feel like it would be more enjoyable changing for the sure, die yeah, faces. For sure, yeah. We only played it on Board Game Arena, but... Yeah, yeah. so... I was already intrigued by the concept alone. Then after having a, started to play Res Arcana so much and loving that as more and more every time I've played it, um, that really got me a little bit more into the idea of Tom Lehman games in general. And even though Race for the Galaxy didn't connect with you, that's mostly because of the theme. And this is, a, once again, in more of a theme that I am, you know, relating yeah, more to, than, yeah. right? With that more fantasy-esque feel. So all that is is making me really excited for this game um and some of the things that are described in the descriptions remind me a little bit of uh res arcana like not the dice construction so much but i think it mentions something where there's like certain die faces that won't be in every single game and so you're basically mm. picking from a bag and these five are the ones that'll join the standard die faces that are um are always available which mean which kind of reminded me of of the cards you're going to have in your deck for res arcana and some games won't even feature certain cards right. which is what made every game of res arcana uh, feel so different and add, add so much variety which if that's what it's uh, alluding to in this one i feel uh, is something that'll resonate with me so uh yeah everything about it sounds really really good i'll, I'll leave more of the explanation to carlo because i feel like he has even more of an attachment and i imagine this is gonna be very high on your list um yeah, but it's one that i think that when it releases uh it'll just be a race to see who gets it first yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and if we want to get really cutthroat with that race when i see it pop up on board game bless i'll like order it and we'll tell you about it and you'll be like, <laughs> well, i was gonna say why don't we just each order each other nope, comments we'll nope, see that first no nope, now we've just decided here who can get <laughs> dice realms first and now it's gonna be like you know those mean games you play or you really like player interaction yeah the this is player case, interaction real life. shopping okay. for board games fair now. enough all right i'll have plenty more to say about fair this enough later. until you i show up at your house and i'm like look what i bought and you're like you gotta be kidding <laughs> i might me. never speak to you again if you <laughs> yeah. order it knowing that you can get me a copy and you don't <laughs> yeah nice pick i didn't expect to see this on your list but i'm happy to see it there yeah all right number four on my list is the other game that was also on my list last year for 2021 that didn't get released uh, another kickstarter game and that is the transcontinental i think this was number four on my list last year so i don't think it has moved um it is a game i'm really excited to get 
Uh, it is a, I believe, first time designer, Glenn Dresser, um, and it's basically about the transcontinental railway, the construction and development uh, of the railway, and even just like the use of it. So it's a worker placement game, but it's got this interesting thing where you're loading up this train and the order you load goods on or unload them on uh, is something you kind of have to puzzle out in advance. And you're also setting, like the train basically goes down the board and then back. So it goes east to west. I don't know if it's just once or multiple times throughout the game, but you basically have to send these telegraphs, put these telegraphs on the board ahead to determine in advance, decide which places you're gonna stop at. And every place you stop at lines up with two different actions on the board. So you have to basically like actually telegraph your, I was about to say, the L word that you <laughs> said yeah, there, and I, I stopped myself. Um, no, but you have to people need to take shots. <laughs> you have to telegraph your actions in advance. Uh, and anyways, basically, I, there's a, a podcast I like a lot called Game Brain Podcast. They played a bunch of the Tabletop Simulator uh, mod, which I've heard a lot of people say is one of the most impressive mods on Tabletop Simulator. It's fully scripted. Um, and that podcast actually did a review of it. And for some of them on that podcast, they said it was one of their top games of 2021 that they played. I haven't dabbled into the uh, the tabletop simulator mod because I want to actually wait until I get the physical copy. But the fact that it is actually like a piece of Canadian history as well, um, all the actual figures that were part of that era that Glenn Dresser has incorporated into the game, it's just something I'm so like uh, eager to just have on my shelf as a Canadian. But I also am very excited for the game. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for the Transcontinental to get here. I think it should be here in the next couple months, and uh, we'll definitely feature it on our channel at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah, I knew this was going to be on your list. Uh, I always seem to I forget about this game because this was one that you were more in tune with and, and had backed and knew way more about than I did. And I haven't listened to that podcast uh, uh, where right. they've talked about it. But I remember from I remember being excited about when you first described it. And I think when I first looked it up, um, and of course the the Canadian ties are something that is just it uh, makes it extra special to want to try to yeah. get it to the table and stuff so i'm really curious to try this and also um it was sort of uh, now i'm comp I know, like not comparing the games but i remember when you were really excited about imperial steam and yeah. you featured in one of your videos and i remember that being a game where i'm like oh interesting like i never would have like blinked at this and then now that we've played it it's like one of my favorite games that we've played in 2021. Yeah. From, like from the one time we played it so for far. For sure, for sure. But it was really memorable that uh, I'm trusting uh, the way that turned out and I'm hoping that Transcontinental works the same way yeah. with you finding a gem, so. For sure, and yeah. I know neither of us tend to gravitate toward train games, but I yeah. think Imperial Steam kind of made us both realize like, oh, train games can maybe be more fun than we think. They don't, you know, yeah. a lot of them kind of look dry or sound way too complex or whatever, but uh, yeah, anyways, Transcontinental. Nice. Uh, my number four is a game that I will absolutely play in 2022 because I pretty much know exactly when it releases and I'm pretty sure it's March uh, or maybe it's April. Um, it's one of the two and that is the Sinister Motives expansion for Marvel Champions. Oh. Uh, so I'm super pumped about this and that's not just because I get excited about Marvel Champions content in general but just because I love Spider-Man. I grew up with the Tobey Maguire movies. I'm going to, as of when we're filming this, I'm going to see the new Spider-Man movie tomorrow night. Um, I, it's, one of my, it's probably my favorite uh, superhero is the only one I have actually read comics of growing up, and this is essentially a Spider-Man expansion. Uh, it features uh, Miles Morales' version of Spider-Man, which is an amazing version of Spider-Man, as well as the uh, Gwen Stacy version uh, of Spider-Man as well. Um, and, or I guess not Spider-Man at that point. I can't remember. I think it's Ghost Spider is, is her name. Um, I'm unfamiliar with that character. But anyways. I don't you, know anything about Marvel, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're just kidding. Don't look over at <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Can you clarify this for me? <laughs> um, but it features like all the, the, the Sinister Six villains and classic villains. So like Sandman and Electro and Venom and, and all like the mainstays are all in the box. And it's also kicking off an entire line of Spider-Verse characters that we're going to get hero packs for. So I think it's going to be an exciting time for Marvel, for Marvel Champions if you're a fan of Spider-Man um, and because I am it's just a box that I know I'm going to love and the heroes in it seem so much fun uh, so I would have been excited for anything Marvel Champions just to see what else or what the twists and turns are they're going to do with the design but the fact that it's Spider-Man just makes it that I'm I think I'm even more excited for this one than I was for the Thanos box because that one is more just like I know that Thanos is a big character but my I didn't have the ties to it that some people do from reading the comics Spider-Man I grew up with so this is like nostalgia this is excitement for Marvel Champions so many things firing on different levels cannot wait to play and I think it comes out March or April Cool. I yeah. wasn't even considering this being on your list. I guess maybe because it was an expansion, but now yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now it makes complete sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, on to my number three, which is, uh, this was Dylan's honorable mention. This is Wormholes. Yeah. This is designed by Peter McPherson, who designed Tiny Towns, and just based on how impressed I was with Tiny Towns as a debut design, 
Uh, I've kind of just been eager to hear about anything else that Peter McPherson is going to design. And this is also, it doesn't play two to six, or I guess Tiny Towns was one to six. This one is two to five players, or maybe it was one to five. I can't remember if there's a solo mode. Um, plays in a similar amount of time, apparently 45 to 60 minutes. And it's a kind of pick up and deliver game where you're picking up passengers and delivering to them to different parts uh, of the galaxy or solar system or whatever. And you're basically creating these wormholes on different spots to kind of basically pop out from one end and pop out somewhere else. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that you can use... I mean, that is interesting itself enough in itself, but yeah. the fact that you can use other players' wormholes and they can use yours, but every time someone uses your wormholes, you gain points for it. That's the Means best part. that, yeah, that you're not only trying to create these wormholes where it suits you, but in places where it, you know, attracts your opponents enough that they're going to use it and it gets you points, but you maybe don't want to help them too much yeah. where the benefit of them using your wormhole is outweighs the benefit of the points you're going to get. So I don't think as of now when we're filming this, I don't think there's even any photos on BGG. There's not a whole lot of info out there. Um, but again, just based on the designer and how much I liked his first game um, and how short the playtime is and how kind of interactive and, and innovative it sounds with that pick up and deliver with moving around and creating different like messing with the way the paths are on the board is something I can't wait to play. Yeah. Uh, this is probably one I'll be uh, buying like as, as soon as I find it in retail. Yeah, I feel the same way, and that's why it just missed my list. Uh, everything about it sounds amazing, but it's that aspect of the victory point sacrifice, because even for the person having to use the wormholes, to then, be, to, to then think... Can I like? Yeah. Can I justify this? Can I give up those points? Am I going to make those back? Is that going to be the difference maker? There's things like that in, in a different form in other games where it's like it's like how do you I sacrifice or how much how many points am I willing to sacrifice in right. service of potentially getting more or or gaining this amount or doing this? And the fact that that's you know ingrained into the the whole system of wormholes makes it super interesting. And I know there's going to be moments where you know I can I can picture the boards the board on the table and us on opposite ends where someone's like, oh, do I want to give you those points? You yeah. Know, I already know those yeah. moments are going to come and those are some of the most amazing moments I had in board games where you're just agonizing and everyone just starts to laugh because you, like, yeah. it's set up the exact way you want it to go, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, that was Wormholes. I think this is published by AEG. Nice. Uh, all right, my number three is a uh, game called Mil Fiori, which is from Reiner mm. Uh That's pretty much the main reason it's on the list is Reiner Knizia, but also the game sounds uh, really, really great and it looks beautiful. So um, I think it might be this one that was considered uh, 2021. Yeah, it's, it's listed at 2021 on Board Game Week, and I'm not sure if that's because it's released in some parts of the world. Uh, I think it's a German publisher, so right. I think it'll probably hit Germany before the end of the year. Yeah, we uh, we will not get our hands on until 2022. No. So for us, it's a 2022 release. Uh, I'm going to be buying it as soon as I can. Um, it's essentially a game that takes place in, in like you know the manufacturing process of glass, um, but the the you are drafting cards where you know in many much the same way you've uh, seen in games like sushi go and other things where you're essentially picking a card and then passing the cards to the next player and then that card that you're playing is influencing where you're placing these um i think they're like diamond shaped pieces mm -hmm. onto the board into one area of this glass manufacturing process and every single section is a different part of that process and each one scores differently and works differently in how you're placing uh these little these little tiles so um it's going to, I think, have a lot of elements of, you know, I might prioritize this, and then at some point my opponent is going to want to jump in to make sure I don't get too many points, but that's going to sacrifice and open up my ability to go to another spot where they now didn't place their tile. And in classic Reiner Kane's of fashion, you're always going to be, like, not able to do everything you want to do, um, and that's going to make it agonizing to say, do I stop my opponent? Do I do what I want to do? Like, I also am limited by the cards that are in my hand, and now I know what I'm passing them, so I, they're going to have to pick from this selection as well. So I know that, okay, if I'm passing two of that, they might try to do that. So can, do I want to block them before they do that? Like, I can already imagine how much I'm going to be agonizing over this and the decisions yeah. uh, I'm going to make. And I'm already, like, just, like, you know, just sitting here like this going, oh, my God, this is everything I, <laughs> I love about right. Reiner PT games. So uh, I cannot wait to play it. I know I'm going to love it. It's going to be one of those ones that we're, I know, again, with Kanitsia games, we always enjoy them. The question for me is going to be how much, where does it rank with other Kanitsia games? And the more of these I play, eventually we're just going to be able to do, we probably already could, but eventually we're going to be able to do a Kanitsia video and say our definitive list on which Kanitsia for games sure. are, are our favorite. So cannot wait to play it. Um, and yeah, I'm sure I'll love it. It's just a matter of how much. Cool. This was literally number 11 on my list. It was the last one I cut was off. Was it literally of the... number 11? Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually number 11 on the list. Just missed it. 
And the reason was that to me, after I read the rule, or not read the, all the rules, but I watched a couple of videos, it looked more like a Stefan Feld game than a Reiner Knizia game you're, to me. You're, you're slowly becoming like you have like you're slowly, or maybe not slowly, maybe quickly <laughs> becoming a, a not a fan of Stefan Feld. Eh? It's not that I'm not a fan. It's that his games sit in this area where like I would play them, but I don't know if I want to seek them out. Yeah. And there was something about it that just looked a little like the theme looked so abstract and right. I don't want to say pasted on, but there was something about it that like just I guess kept it from being just a little you know shortly uh, or just shy of this list. So right. yeah. it's one I am eager to play. I'm just a little skeptical about how much I'm going to like it long term. That's right. all. Right, got it. All right, number two on my list is a game I've spoken about before in a prior video, and that is Fire and Stone. So this is a game designed by uh, Klaus Jürgen Vrede, who designed Carcassonne, one of my favorite games of all time, the game that got me into the hobby, the modern day game at least. Uh, and this is gonna be published. I think this is another one that's listed as a 2021 game. Um, I've actually been in contact with the publisher and they've uh, informed us that it will only be released in 2022 in North America. So uh, it sounds like it's gonna be a little more complex than Carcassonne in the, in, uh, in the rules, but basically it takes place in the Stone Age uh, and you're playing on this map where there's all these face, there's a single face down tile on every spot. They're called the uh, discovery tokens. And you start with a scout and on your turn, you're gonna move a scout uh, to a place and then you're going to activate a tile so if the tiles face down you're going to flip it over and get its discovery effect but let's say that tile was already face up and you go there then instead you're going to get its um, whatever it's called the activation effect so tiles are going to do different things or tokens whether they've already been discovered or not so on your turn you're always going to have to decide do i want to go somewhere where i know what's there and take advantage of the ability or do i want to explore the map more and there's all kinds of stuff. You can get uh, these inventions, which give you basically abilities that last throughout the game that can set you apart from your um, opponents. Uh, you can get a second scout at a certain point in the game that allows you to keep exploring more areas. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me most is that in every game, one single one of those face down tokens is gonna be a cave. And at the beginning of the game, there's I think like 20 or 30 of these cave cards and every game is gonna be one unique card. And when someone discovers it, um, like everyone's gonna be kind of racing to try and find this cave because it has some sort of unique ability and the first person to discover it gets some really, uh, like some huge benefit basically. Yeah, yeah. So every time you're gonna be looking around and thinking of the tiles that haven't been flipped, like where's that cave? How badly do I wanna go try and find that cave? Yeah. Um, and then there's different areas you can explore the further the game goes on, phase two, phase three and whatnot. There's like area majority scoring with laying down huts. The rule book is only five or six pages. I read through the whole rule book and it was immediately like, this is an insta buy for me. As soon as I can get my hands on this, I will be playing it. You will see content for this on our channel. Uh, yeah, it looks just one of like those really simple games that offers a lot of uh, depth, like the more you kind of go back to it. So yeah, that's Fire and Stone. Um, it almost made my number one actually. Nice, I, I actually put this on my short list and then I knew it was gonna be on your list and realistically the reason, I hadn't done much research on it. It was just you describing it to me mm -hmm. that made me go, you know what, I actually will, I know I'll enjoy this game and I probably will enjoy it. I'll even end up enjoying it more than some of the games that I've mentioned on this list. But it just didn't feel right because I didn't know a lot about it and I knew that it was like more so to, through learning it. Through right. You. Yeah, so I, I can't wait to play it. It's kind of the same way I felt about Land versus Sea. I, I right. came into that so late despite you mentioning it many times but then after I looked at, uh, into it it was like, oh man, this is absolutely a game I'm going to enjoy. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then yeah, I, I knew it was a game I would end up just playing at your place kind of thing. Yeah. Um, same thing with like... Just mooch off my collection. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. it's so There's so many games that I've slowly like mooched off your collection. Blue Lagoon, same thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I cannot wait to play this one as well, and I'm sure that if I enjoy it as much as I think I might, I'll end up wanting to have my own copy of it. Yeah, too. for sure. Yeah, and it's Fire and Stone. Nice. Uh, my number two was my number two last uh, time we did this, and uh, it still has not released. And I'm hoping it re releases this year, and that is Oath Sworn into the Deepwood. Oh, okay, um, yeah. So this is a giant campaign game that I backed a long time ago, uh, and it was a last minute back for me. Um, I didn't even back the version that comes with all these apparently ridiculously amazing miniatures that they're taking extra time to develop because it's a brand new miniature type process that they're using to, to develop them. Um, that's why it, it's taken so long. Um, I actually just did the standees because I just wanted to play the actual game. I, I wasn't about the miniatures for me. Um, but there's just, I won't go into everything because I have mentioned this before and talked about it at length, but it is a campaign game. It does have more of a focus, uh, more so on like uh, big boss type battles um, against creatures and, and focus on taking them down and, and you know, uh, const constructing, not even constructing, uh, leveling up and powering up your characters and advancing their gear um, in a way that's going to help you tackle these scenarios um, before you venture off into them. So uh, 
again, I'm a campaign game fiend, especially ones that are done well. And, you know, I even play ones that weren't done well, like Tainted Grail and stuff. I just like the experience, um, even when it ends up not hitting with me. So uh, I'm crossing my fingers that this uh, hits with me as much as I thought it would when I first read the Kickstarter campaign and decided to back it. I really hope it delivers uh, this year. It continues to get delayed. Um, I, I've resigned myself to just thinking, I'll probably play this in November 2022 or something, because then if I get it before that, I'll be pleasantly surprised and, and everything, rather than... Uh, and then if it's after that, I'll be disappointed again. Right. But maybe you'll see this on uh, next year's list too, or maybe at that point I'll just uh, think I'm jinxing and stop putting it on. But <laughs> if you want to learn more, I put some photos on the screen. But if you want to learn more, you can hear me describe it in more detail in the last video. And if you still want to learn more, you can hear me describe it in my most anticipated cancer 2023 probably. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's hope we play it this year. And if we do, I'll for sure be putting content on the channel. And especially for those who are curious more about it, I'll have plenty more to say. Nice. Yeah. Uh, honestly, wait, what's the player count for this one? Or what player count are you going to aim to play your campaign at? Any campaign, I usually try to do four uh, if I can, because I always find that that's the most fun around the table. That backfired with Tainted Grail. That's what I was going to um, ask you. So, yeah. Um, I, I'll probably end up doing some research to see if there's a desired player count. I can't see me doing only two, uh, unless it's it's just I have so many campaign games going on that it's just it's just there's only one other person willing to come at that right. point. I can see trying to do three. Maybe that's the sweet spot for a lot mm -hmm. of these campaign games. Minimum two. I won't tackle this one solo. Um, right. It'll be with with other people for sure. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I look forward to hearing more about it. Yeah. All right, and my number one most anticipated game is one that Dylan mentioned previously, he was absolutely right, uh, is Dice Realms. Again, Tom Lehman, this is going to be published by Rio Grande. Um, yeah, honestly, this game, I think it said, what is it, seven or 600 or 700 different uh, dice faces that are going to come yeah. in the box. Like, it's going to be a pretty pricey game. Over, I think it said over 300,000 unique combinations for the setup based on those tiles that you mentioned that come out that determine which dice you can get. Uh, plays over I think five rounds uh, you're gonna be basically one of the cool things I like is how interactive the system is because at first when I heard that it's like this dice rolling thing I thought it was gonna be like oh you have your own pool you're doing more of your own thing but there's gonna be you have your own dice but every like uh, turn or round someone's gonna roll the fate die and it's gonna be something that affects all the players and depending what you roll it might you know affect the food supply in the game or it might affect something else that comes uh, into play and I think you start the game with two basic dice but throughout the game you're not only getting more dice that so you might have more than two you know four five six seven eight dice but then you're also converting them into different things so everyone kind of starts on an equal footing and it's going to be interesting to see the different directions you can go and it says the game plays in like 45 to 60 minutes so i like that a lot uh, my other two favorite tom Lehman games i guess oh no it's not the only two other ones i've played um it's race for the galaxy and res arcana have a similar length like play time and that kind of variability um from from one play to the next the only like slight thing I'm skeptical of is that I have tried Roll for the Galaxy and I did not like it anywhere near as much as Race. Um, I have only tried the app and it was only a couple times, um, but still the fact that Res Arcana was such a hit as one of his recent games and just everything I've read about this has me super excited for this. I will definitely bu uh, be buying this as soon as I can get my hands on it. So this is another one uh, you can definitely expect to see featured on the channel. Yeah, I won't add anything to there. I've already talked about it, but I am just as pumped. Well, I mean, no, I'm not just as pumped. You're way obviously yeah, more You're one-fifth, right? It was your number <laughs> yeah. five. It was your yeah. one-fifth one as pumped as pumped. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> uh, my number one game, I'm pretty sure you could, uh, yeah. you could bet a million dollars and get it right, and that is Frosthaven. Uh, I thought this was going to come out in 2021. I, was, I, I wasn't I was devastated because I, I know it's just, you know, the delays are going to make it be a better experience. Experience. I can't wait to play it. I'm honestly not even going to spend that much time talking about it because I have a video that is the things I'm most excited about with Frosthaven. We're going to be yeah. doing a ton of content when it actually comes out, um, you know, class deep dives and and uh, of some sort of review when we've actually experienced the game. We will be featured on the channel. I want to cover it a whole bunch and, uh, you know, have a bunch of resources for people. It is a game that is a follow-up to the... Um, Actually, you know what? I'm not, it was on my top 50 of all time, and it was very high up. Right. No spoilers. Go check it out. Um, but it's a game I absolutely adore. I played over two years, uh, the original Gloomhaven and the expansion with a group. I have so many fond memories of it. Frosthaven is just going to be, uh, you know, it's going to it's going to really feel like a step uh, out of the pandemic in many ways because we had yeah. to stop Gloomhaven because of the pandemic and had to and finish it after. And it's going to feel like Frosthaven is like finally saying we're back, we're doing this again. Even if it's a different group, even if it's like more fluctuation because everyone's lives have changed and some their people are coming and going more, it is just going to feel like, hey, I have a regular gaming group again and uh, I just love all the changes that are coming to it too. So cannot wait to play it and you will definitely see it on our channel.
Yeah, I'm very impressed with how many things uh, are going to be different in this game from the original. And uh, yeah, I'm very curious to see uh, how it turns out. Yeah. So those are our most anticipated games. Let us know in the comments what games you cannot wait to play in 2022 and which ones you thought were going to be on our list and weren't or ones you were surprised to see on our list. Um, or and maybe even just tell us games in the, in the channel that are coming out because we obviously have not uh, considered every game because there's so many that get announced. There's probably some that have you know slipped under our radar. Yeah. So let us know in the comments and let's uh, let's see how many of these games we actually get our hands on in 2022. Yeah, and how Hopefully many end up on next year's list instead, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Happy New Year. Uh, let's hope everyone 2022 is uh, you know the best it could be especially after these last couple of years um, and yeah thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time